Today on Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by flight instructor and IFR Magazine contributor Elaine Ko. She tells us about takeoff briefings, technology overload, and flying tail draggers. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Hello, everyone. I'm John Zimmerman of Sporties, and thanks for listening. Remember to visit sporties.com slash podcast for show links and complete archives, and send your comments to podcast at sporties.com. We are closing out IFR month here at Sporties, a month-long celebration of instrument flying. And today I am joined by Elaine Coe to talk about that topic and much more. She is an independent flight instructor specializing in transition training for tailwheel, high-performance, and technically advanced airplanes. She's also an aircraft owner, corporate pilot, author, and speaker, so she knows aviation from many different angles. As a contributing editor at IFR Magazine, she writes some of the best articles out there on the real world of instrument flying. And as a side note, if you're not an IFR subscriber, I would highly recommend it. Anybody who's instrument rated or thinking about it, a must read. Elaine, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Great. Thanks for having me. I have a whole host of questions about IFR procedures and habits, so let's just dive right in. Sure. First up, some people suggest that once you have an instrument rating, you should file IFR all the time, even when the weather is good. Do you agree with that advice? I think that if that method works for you, I have heard that saying I file IFR all the time, uh, but I don't see that it's necessary uh, literally all the time. There are uh, lots of situations where it may not work. It may be more time consuming. It may actually interfere with uh, the other fellow VFR traffic out there. And uh, so I, th- I think it's a case by case basis. So if it's clear in 100 and you're at a non towered airport, don't clog up the airspace by getting a clearance on the ground. You're probably at that point, you're probably not going to be interfering with other RFR traffic coming in and out. But uh, I think it's, again, a case by case basis. If it's uh, clear in a million and you're trying to get to an airport that uh, maybe is sequencing traffic or that maybe is uh, more on the IFR side, uh, certainly that would be great. It could be clear in a million where you're starting out and maybe a little more towards the IFR end of the weather spectrum where you're going. So that would be a good case where it would just be handy to even uh, take off VFR and pick up your clearance in the air if the circumstances are are good to do so. So I really think about it as, is this going to work for me really well today all the way? Is this going to work really well part of the way? Or is this a case where I'm just hopping up to the next airport uh, 10 miles up for to Let's say go to lunch with a friend. Do I uh, do that IFR or VFR? But it's definitely a question you ask when you've got uh, the rating. Let's talk about that scenario of departing, a, especially a non-towered airport. Do you have a personal minimum for departing VFR and picking up a clearance in the air versus getting on the ground? Does it have to be certain weather for you to be comfortable with that? Yes. And the uh, fact that just brings back the memory of when it was a, a brand new uh, double I and we were circling around and non-towered airport trying to pick up the clearance and couldn't get quite high enough to get it. So we had to circle back down just to keep things safe and uh, call back for that. Um, So I think uh, from that experience, I've always tried to use traffic pattern plus a little bit of a margin just in case uh, it's lower on the other side of the airport. I've seen that as well. And if you can get that and uh, you can get a way to get back down VFR, uh, just in case you had a mechanical issue, just in case you had a comm issue, um, or in my case, I just wasn't in uh, radio range at that altitude, um, there's uh, 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 a good way to think about adding some cushion there if you're going to be departing. If you get the clearance on the ground and you're, you're ready to go, um, I think a lot of us uh, teach our instrument students to use, let's say, like the approach minimums or your personal approach minimums as your departure minimums, just in case you had to get back in. And that's a that's a typical way of looking at it. Let's talk about the other end of an IFR flight. When is it okay to cancel IFR in flight and continue VFR? Do you have any hard and fast rules for that? I personally don't have any hard and fast rules about that. Again, I hear a lot of people uh, with the rule just wait till you're on the ground, uh, wait till you've landed, and then you can cancel IFR. But I've seen that there are no two flights that are the same. Um, I like to try to stick to that rule when I can, but there are times when somebody's uh, waiting to get out and they're actually calling you up on the radio saying, hey, can we, uh, can we get that uh, cancellation? Are you good to do that so that we can get out of there? Uh, a couple of things like that have happened. Again, uh, I always urge people 
don't fail to pressure at that point to cancel if uh, if you're not comfortable. Go all the way in if you have to. But there are times when, it, again, it's clear in a million at your destination, and it may be uh, actually safer to start talking on the advisory frequency rather than uh, remaining IFR. Um, I know that uh, they'll hand you off to the advisory, you know, a few miles out, but sometimes it's a case of um, just wanting to get back into the flow of that uh, VFR traffic pattern if you need to, because there could be a lot going on uh, down there on the ground and in the pattern where you may just want to dedicate yourself uh, to that mode if, if the, the case calls for it. Yeah, I think you raise a great point there about flexibility. Some people think IFR flying is extremely rigid, and, and certainly it is in many ways. You follow the procedure, you fly your altitude, but there's a lot of room, I think, for flexibility in how you approach the problem-solving part of IFR flying of questions like this. Would you agree? Yeah. So in fact, a lot of the uh, article ideas uh, that come across the desk are about uh, that struggle with really trying to be consistent every time you do a procedure, a checklist. Of course, we all like to, to teach that, to practice that. But you you see that uh, that one time where something's a little different, that one time where something will catch you off guard and I'll get a question saying, uh, hey, I had to break off my routine. I, I used to stay IFR all the time from uh, point A to point B, and and this time I was uh, not able to do that. Was that okay? Sure, that that should that that should be perfectly fine. I think we uh, have to learn to be flexible under that umbrella of discipline in order to really make things work for us in the most comfortable, safest way possible. And sometimes it takes changing that routine a little bit. However, the, the downside to that is sometimes uh, if you're not comfortable making a snap decision for something you haven't encountered before, that's something that I talk about in the articles where the more flexible you can be, the better, but don't let that push you into something you're not comfortable with. Let's talk about glass cockpits, which can sometimes blur that line of what you're comfortable with. Uh, it can particularly be confusing for pilots who learned on steam gauges. And you've written about this in IFR Magazine recently. What can pilots do to avoid that technology overload that sometimes sets in? Sure. And the first few hours of uh, transitioning into, let's say we call the six pack or the eight pack, even with a lot of instrument time into uh, a glass cockpit can be pretty overwhelming. I found that uh, everybody's brains are wired a little bit differently in terms of um, how quickly you can make that transition for the ones who um, express that feeling of being overwhelmed, uh, they they basically say, look, I've got too much on here and on the screen. What can I do to help with that? Obviously, uh, good ground briefings, good ground training before you get into the actual uh, aircraft in flight is, is the best way to go. But I found that sometimes things can work perfectly on the ground and not so perfectly in the air. So I have um, a couple of methods to try to work around that with people who, who do have a hard time um, transitioning. And that is to try to use that, uh, that law of learning where you're correlating things you already know to, uh, things that you are trying to learn. So I try to actually treat that glass cockpit a little bit like that six pack that they're used to and say, Hey, remember the airspeed is still going to be in the upper left corner. Your attitude is still going to be in the center and so on and so forth. Your, your altitude is generally still going to be in the right side or on the uh, upper right hand corner. And so if you try to kind of layer your scan that way and just look at flying the basics first and making sure that you've got that scan of you know airspeed, attitude, altitude, things like that, and then go from there without adding on all the other layers of you know, your navigational, um, even the needle, the heading changes, things like that can get a little overwhelming at first. So sometimes just a little bit of a basic flying around, even without uh, any hood or any cloudy weather or anything like that seems to be the best way to go. Um, I think we, we talked earlier about, uh, uh, I call that layering the decks. Just have your, have your priorities there on maybe uh, three things at a time, your speed, attitude, altitude. Make sure those are steady before you bring other, other things into play. Um, it's still pretty challenging for some people to tune out all the other things that are happening on the screen, but that does come, that does get easier with time. I like that concept of layering the decks a lot. You know, you hear a lot in, in the world, especially airline world about 
automation and the different levels of automation. You can fly raw data and then you can add a flight director, but still be manually flying. And then you can add the autopilot. And then some airplanes, you can even add auto throttle and these sort of different levels of automation and understanding which level you're on and knowing when to step down a level, especially if something goes wrong. But I think that doesn't just apply to autopilots. There's no reason we can't do that with a glass cockpit, as you suggest here with layering the decks, that if you're overwhelmed by the multifunction display and everything, let's get back to just the first level of, of basic attitude flying. So I think that's a great way to think about it. But speaking of autopilots, I'm curious w- what role you think that plays here. How do you layer that into the deck of doing instrument training and, and learning to fly IFR with more and more capable autopilots in airplanes these days? What role should that play during instrument training? Sure. There's so many ways to approach that. I think a lot of it uh, is, again, case by case. I like to not try to stick with just one way of teaching something or teaching a glass cockpit or introducing the autopilot. So for for some people, it can be an off and on altitude and heading hold, I think is a good first way of introducing the autopilot when you need a break from the workload. So let's say we're working on, it's you know, hour three and we're working on airspeed, at, uh, altitude, attitude, the, the basics, and then we'll start bringing in something else. Okay. Now let's uh, hand fly to a, uh, a new heading. Let's practice that next step of turns to headings. Hand flying, okay, they may give that a try, turn back to the heading, and then they need a break. I'll say, okay, well, we can hold our heading and altitude right here. Go ahead and push this and push this, and we can take a little breather here. And that's a great way of showing how the autopilot can really be used to reduce workload, to give you a break while still managing um, the, the basics there and making sure that you're not getting off heading, off altitude. And for some people, that comes pretty quickly. And then you can start introducing, again, more layers in the deck with the autopilot. Um, There are uh, some people who probably need to wait a little bit on the autopilot because if you kind of sense that maybe it's a little too much for them at the time, I actually am a big fan of just sticking with hand flying for uh, several hours just to make sure they've got that aircraft control skill down before introducing the autopilot. Uh, But again, just taking a break off the workload is one good way of just introducing that and then going from there. So I'm not, I'm not at all against uh, the the autopilot. There's uh, so many things it can be used for. And I think just making sure that we're not using it just for that one thing or for a couple of uh, dedicated tasks is is, uh, probably the way to to teach it properly that are, um, that, uh, that you introduce the idea of layers of automation, layers in which you use the autopilot without uh, totally depending on it because I, I'm always a, a fan of what if it breaks? And that's really become a focus of my recurrent training is what if this breaks? What if the autopilot doesn't work? Even though it's been uh, serving you well all along, can you get along without it? You were telling me recently about a pet peeve of yours about how many pilots you fly with don't seem to really know their basic operational numbers. Tell me what you mean by that. Basic operational numbers that would uh, start with V speeds. I f- have found that um, a lot of pilots kind of get away from remembering all the V speeds that would apply to them. And I think a lot of that comes down to you'll learn all this when you first transition to the airplane or you, you, know, you learn all this when you're getting ready for a check ride. And some of that seems to fade away over time as you're out there flying on your own. I always wondered why that is. And it kind of became clear to me when um, my local safety team started doing seminars on pre-takeoff briefings. And we noticed that a lot of pilots aren't trained to do those. I certainly was not trained to do pre-takeoff briefings when I was working on my private pilot or I, I believe even my instrument rating. And so you kind of see that a lot of those V-speeds will drop out of memory because you're not briefing yourself on them every time. Uh, You're not saying, well, this will be this kind of takeoff. My VY is 101 knots, so on and so forth. And if you don't get in the habit of doing those every time, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those operational speeds are going to fall by the wayside. And it's not the best way to operate because you really don't want to be taking off and landing with, I wouldn't say would, I wouldn't say that these are random airspeeds people are using, but just kind of average airspeeds that you get used to over time and not really being sure of, well, where do I really need to be at at this time? And a lot of people think about takeoff briefings as something that professional pilots do or as something in the turbine world. 
Uh, but to be clear, you're talking about a pre-takeoff briefing, pretty much any airplane. And even if you're solo, right, there's no, no problem with talking yourself a little bit before takeoff, right? Oh, sure. Sure. That can be anything in the form of uh, a written checklist. Some have a really short checklist. Okay, I'm going to be making sure uh, the uh, transponder's on, my trim is set, uh, the things like the, the landing light is on, whatever works for your aircraft or for, for the type of operation you're doing. Um, and that can go all the way up to, uh, like you said, a verbal briefing, because it'll be a case where you're at a different airport. You're, uh, you just landed somewhere where you haven't been before. And even though you know the length of the runway and you see, okay, there's some trees on the other end, I need to be aware of uh, the takeoff performance here. It's good to just run through that before you're actually taking off so that you've made sure that you covered all the bases there. And some people will say, well, isn't it awfully repetitive to do that every time from your home airport? Sure, it can be, but uh, that's that that shouldn't make it a bad thing. Um, you talked about uh, professional crews doing takeoff briefings as a as a given, and if we just take a little bit of that and put it uh, put it to practical use for the GA pilot or for the single engine solo pilot, I think it can be really useful because it can be really anything you need it to be. Uh, anywhere from the the real short takeoff briefing that you do routinely to the longer one uh, based on the situations that are a little different from what you normally do. That's great advice. I think the pre-takeoff briefing, if nothing else, gets your mind kind of in the mode of we're going flying now and have I thought about the key things that I need to think about. So great tip for any pilot. Elaine, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, I want to ask you a few questions about corporate flying and Cirrus aircraft. Earn your instrument rating or get current with Sporty's award-winning instrument rating course. It's everything you need to ace your FAA knowledge test and become a safe instrument pilot. With dynamic in-flight video, powerful test prep tools, and a complete document library. Sporty's course works on all your devices from iPhone to laptop to Apple TV. And your purchase includes free lifetime updates. We're so confident our course is complete we guarantee it. Pass all three FAA tests or get your money back. Visit sporties.com slash instrument to learn more. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We're back with Elaine Co, who does a lot of tailwheel instructing when she's not flying IFR. Is that dramatically different from instrument flying when you're flying a tail dragger or in some ways are some of the basics the same? How different is that experience flying one and the other? Well, I have to admit that I have yet to fly a tail dragger, uh, truly IFR. I've done some instruction in uh, other uh, fellow pilots, uh, tail, tail draggers in instrument instruction, but I have not done that myself. That's something I need to, to check a box with. Um, so if you talk about, let's say, VFR tail dragger flying, like what we normally uh, picture, that uh, that is pretty different from what you would call IFR flying or IFR cross country flying, we're going from you know point A to point B and, and maybe the conditions are IFR. But there's a there's a lot in common. Uh, you're you're still flying an airplane. You're still going to do all the things you need to do to prepare for that flight in terms of the aircraft, where you're uh, taking off uh, out of, where you're going, and the weather and all again, all the things that uh, come into play. You're still checking out the same boxes, so to speak. Uh, you're still doing that pre-takeoff briefing. It may be a little different uh, between a VFR and IFR, but I think all those things still come into play. And for pilots who have both of those modes uh, in their flying, it's just good to make sure you've got some consistencies in between because, uh, again, it's uh, easy to forget things if you're jumping from aircraft to aircraft like some flight instructors are or going from IFR mode to VFR mode and, again, making sure that you've covered all the bases. Having said that, um, I do some terrible instruction out of a little grass strip in Southeast Wisconsin. It is great fun. And I would call that a pretty different world from uh, uh, IFR flying where you might be going from a bigger airport to another bigger airport in, uh, in a, four, a larger four seat aircraft. So I'd say that those are two different modes of flying and uh, both both modes uh, have their um, other aspects that are incredibly fun and so in that way it's it's pretty different um i know a lot of a lot of discussions center around well what's what's tail whale flying like for for those who want to transition you know how different is it from a nose wheel uh 
the nose wheel uh, four seater I've been flying all my life. And, and those are all great discussions to have because I just really have a lot of fun with saying, well, it's a lot of what you already do. Uh, it'll just be a little different in terms of this airplane and hopefully it'll help you enjoy that, uh, that uh, nose wheel aircraft that you're still flying even more. So it's, it's just great fun to talk about and to get people in, in those discussions. I noticed that instrument flying made me more precise as a pilot. I sort of paid attention more and and held myself maybe to slightly higher standards. And I found that made me a little bit better tailwheel pilot. And then I sort of accepted less variation in, you know, glide path and, and heading control. And so while it's very, very different, as you say, uh, I felt to me like there were some things that applied across both. And I will say I did once get to shoot a real RNAV approach in actual IMC in a Cetabria, and it was a surreal experience. So <laughs> anybody who wants to go fly IFR in a tailwheel, if nothing else, ATC is really freaked out when you call up on the radio with that. So, Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not used to uh, hearing a Satarbi IFR. Uh, some of the larger tailwheels that I've instructed in, sometimes they're, sometimes they're uh, um, the controllers who've heard that before, or they've got aircraft based on the field. But uh, for me to say, uh, you know, decathlon one, two, three, four, five on the on the ILS, that would be great. I, I don't, I uh, don't have uh, that uh, that kind of equipment yet, where I can just kind of have that any time I want. But uh, it's it's great to jump into other pilots' aircraft and see it. Uh, a tail whale on the back and a good instrument uh, panel up front. That's always great fun, and so you get to get to uh, have both worlds there. And uh, like you mentioned, I, I agree that uh, the IFR aspects, uh, flying uh, really precisely, having that fine touch, having a real stabilized approach, uh, just makes you a better pilot overall. And does it translate to something like tail whale flying? Sure, because it goes the other way around. Uh, tail whale flying has helped me in the other aircraft I fly I've, um, back into the the Piper Archers or the 172s, when I uh, learned how to fly tail whales, it, it automatically just made my landings and all the aircraft I flew a lot better, a lot more precise. I was a little bit more uh, uh, aware of what uh, the rudder was doing, of course, and I, I think it goes both ways. Let's talk about Cirrus aircraft. We, we've talked about glass cockpit versus six pack, tail wheels versus tricycle gear. You also log a lot of time in Cirrus, as I do, and some people get really excited about what a big difference that airplane is. That it's it's a whole new airplane versus somebody who learned to fly in a Cessna or a Piper with the side stick and everything. What do you find is actually the reality there? How different is it learning to fly or transitioning into a Cirrus out of a Cessna or a Piper? Sure, and, and, and get that question a lot for people who are interested in either transitioning in, into a, a, a Cirrus or into something similar like that. I basically tell them, look, it's it's a four seat airplane. It's not all that different. It's a fabulous airplane. Uh, it's got uh, great. It's been built with great materials. Uh, when uh, I first started getting into that, it was the latest and greatest in the avionics for that category aircraft. And so I talk about all the all the great features it has. And being a a newer model aircraft, you're just going to have those things uh, more modernized and uh, really really much easier to use. But having said that, I, I always tell people that it's just like transitioning into any other aircraft that's going to be maybe in the same category, but there's some different configurations with it, some things that are a little different in the handling of it, but it all comes down to the same thing. Um, and by the way, that everyone asks, always asks about the side stick, you know, going from a yoke to a side stick. And I say, you know, you'll get used to it in about 10 minutes. In fact, you'll really, really like it because you can just have the, the left hand on the side and uh, it takes uh, just a fine touch to control the airplane. It's incredibly maneuverable. And a lot of people find that to be true where they get in it right away. And he said, yeah, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought in terms of uh, flying the airplane. And for all the other differences, like uh, we talked about going from a six pack to a glass cockpit, th those things will come in time. And I think that if you just take that one step at a time, the way you transition to anything else that's different, it really comes down to it's it's an airplane. If you're going from a high wing to a low wing, that may be a little different. If you're uh, going from an older panel to a newer panel, that may be a little different. Um, takeoffs and landings are certainly different. I always do a really good uh, uh, a good briefing on what to expect coming out of something like a, a Cessna 172 or something that a lot of people fly and say, well, here's how you're going to do this a little differently or here's what's going to look different. Here's what's going to feel different. 
the inputs will be a little different. But in the end, it comes down to the same principles, getting getting people really good at that stabilized approach on airspeed down to the landing, making the landing uh, work in a way that's uh, nice and smooth, just the way you would in, in any other aircraft that you've flown before. Now, Elaine, you're also a corporate pilot in addition to all your flight instruction. And something you write about a lot in IFR Magazine, I think, is that real world of getting somewhere uh, in the trade-offs between safety, comfort, schedule, all these somewhat competing priorities. So I'm, cur- I'm curious how you handle that schedule pressure in particular as a corporate pilot. Any tips for staying safe while trying to satisfy passengers at the same time? How do you balance that? Sure. And it comes down to whether that you know, whether that pressure is coming from the, the schedule, whether uh, people are in a, in a hurry and you're usually going to be in a hurry. Uh, that actually is really no different from uh, personal flying because you've got pressure from your passengers as a as a uh, as a personal flyer in your own aircraft, getting uh, people, your family from point A to point B. There's going to be the weather pressure. Um, corporate aircraft obviously have more capabilities when it comes to weather, but all of those limitations will still apply in terms of what the pilot and the aircraft are equipped to do. So again, really, it's uh, not a lot of differences in principles, just some differences in the in the specifics. And so uh, you, you you asked about handling the pressure. Well, it's I, I think there's pressure everywhere. Um, when you're a flight instructor, you've got the pressure of keeping those appointments, keeping those flight lessons going. And it all comes down to no matter what uh, mode of flying you're in, do what you need to do to prepare for that flight. Don't rush to the extent that you're going to overlook something or make a mistake and never let that pressure you into something that you are not comfortable doing. And again, that applies at, at, in all modes of flying. Uh, it's, just a, it's just the specifics that are, are different in terms of the aircraft, the equipment, um, um, how far you're going, how high you're going, but, but they still apply. Somebody once told me, I thought great advice on this was make sure that pressure actually exists first. <laughs> you know, you may assume that my passengers are desperate to take off at 10 a.m. and life will be over if they don't take off at 10, but maybe they don't care. And maybe if they took off at two and the weather was much better, that would be just fine. So it doesn't hurt to verify that that, that pressure is, is there before you uh, go get stressed out about it. So that's a great point because if you are briefing your passengers on what's going on, if there's a weather limitation, um, I I found that they are just more than understanding in terms of uh, that's great. Thanks for letting us know you do what you need to do. Um, And when everything is going smoothly, it really does go quick and you find yourself uh, just right on time. And that's, that's very satisfying. And 99% of the time, uh, that's the way it goes, and it's great to be able to uh, you know do that in all modes of flying, making sure that you're set up to um, make sure that you're not causing undue delays or creating that kind of pressure that may not be there in the first place. So it's it's something that comes with um, just experiencing and experiencing that and making sure that uh, you're good to go in the way you need to be, um, even if it's something that uh, re- will require a quick turn because we certainly have that in a in um, corporate flying, uh, but just making sure that you're, you're comfortable with what you're doing. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time and practice and, and getting better at it as you go. All right, Elaine, at the end of every episode, we like to close with a lightning round we call Ready to Copy. So I'll ask some questions on a variety of topics. You give me your quick answer. Are you ready to copy? I am ready. Would you rather fly an LPV approach or an ILS approach if the weather's low? LPV. And why is that? It's going to be a lot more reliable in terms of the navigation. It's going to keep you on a on a more precise, straighter track with uh, no chance of signal glitches and the things that uh, we've seen on the localizers and glide slopes when you're using an ILS. Of course, if that's there and that's that's uh, ready to use, wouldn't mind that at all. In fact, uh, a lot of a lot of the times that's what you end up flying. But I think an LPV is uh, definitely more reliable and precise and dependable. Is it ever okay to do a zero zero takeoff? I think that's up to the pilot and the situation and the aircraft. Um, I have done them, but it's it's always a case of you've got to be ready to say, I'm not going to do this, even if you're really at the beginning of the takeoff roll and and something is making you uncomfortable. You've just got to be ready to pull out of that when you can. Um, aside from that, if you do decide to go, and um, I'm thinking more of um, 
more of the multi-engine flying aspects where you you may have uh, two of you deciding this and two of you helping monitor the situation as you take off. Um, are you are you fully briefed? Are you fully briefed on the plan B? And um, you know what else do you need to talk about before you do that? Um, I think you might be asking also about uh, do, I, do, you, do you teach this to uh, um, up and coming instrument pilot single engine airplane? We do practice them uh, when uh, when the time comes to do that, but we have a really long talk about well, are you really going to do this for real? It's a, I think a lot of the times in that situation you're never going to do a zero zero takeoff. Um, that's not something I'm uh, comfortable with in most of the aircraft I fly, but there are some situations um, getting into a, a more high performance aircraft where it can be viable. But again, you, you've got to make sure you answer all the questions before you even decide to go. And um, so, so to answer the question, I think it is uh, something that's feasible some of the time, but most of the time, no. The answer, like many things in aviation, it depends, right? <laughs> it, it depends. It depends, and that's that's a lot. That's a lot of uh, you know the discussion about being disciplined yet being flexible enough to know whether you can uh, really make something work. Are contact approaches a helpful tool or a dangerous trap for instrument pilots? Contact approaches again. Uh, it, <laughs> it it depends. Um, <laughs> You can make that a tool if the if the time is right, but you need to make it safe. You need to make it legal. You need to truly understand how they work. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about when and where um, and, and how you can you can do a contact approach. And I think I've actually seen that in practice maybe once um, at a in a at an airport where it was at typical. Little hard to little hard to get in VFR, but you could get in IFR. But they were still doing visual approaches, and then you maybe ask for something like you can ask for something like that just to just just to make it work and in, in kind of an in between mode. But I find that uh, I find that for the most part they're not really very useful at all because there's really no problem in taking a few more minutes to fly a full approach. But it's something that you do talk about because it is a tool out there that again once in a great while, it may be something that could come in handy. And I'm always thinking about emergencies because you get a lot of discussions about, well, I would never do uh, an approach down to minimums because that's not my personal minimums, or I would never do a contact approach, or I would never do this. Well, I tend to I tend to look at those as tools just in case you really need them. And that's why I still continue to discuss those and uh, practice those with people because it's another tool in the toolbox. And that's Really, what uh, I, I like about some of uh, some of these procedures that we don't do uh, that we don't do too often. You get to change one thing about instrument currency regulations. What would it be? Should we get rid of the holding requirements? Should we make it ten approaches in six months? What would you do that would make it more meaningful and helpful? Oh, that's a good question. I think that uh, the IPC requirements could maybe become a little bit more useful by trimming them down, uh, I believe we still need to do uh, things like the precision approach, the non-precision approach, and the arc. And I think if we um, kind of make that fit fit more with the times and what people are using, um, certainly holding procedures still come into play, uh, especially uh, with some, some approaches that are still out there, or qu quite a few that are still out there. Or um, again, using that holding procedure as a tool because you need to buy some time or you're having an issue or you need to you need to actually uh, park it somewhere in the sky to uh, to figure something out. I think that a lot of that could still be a part of an IPC, but I think just making that more useful or making that as part of uh, some kind of the, a recurrency program would be great. Um, I really don't want to see a lot more requirements and boundaries and limits for uh, people keeping their currency or people uh, – looking to do a recurrent training and having all these uh, things you need to check off. But I think that somehow making that a little, little bit more realistic or making that more useful to the pilot to actually get them better and refreshed on these things that they, they need to uh, uh, be proficient at would be, would be the way to go. Um, the six month grace period for instrument currency I haven't thought a lot about how that could change, but I know that something might need to be adjusted there. It just doesn't seem to be a really useful anymore because you find that um, the IPC is uh, just a little bit better in terms of having people uh, figure out what they need to work on 
Um, and doing that every six months is a great way, I think, of, of uh, keeping sharp on things. It's just something where it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not uh, utilized as much as it could be. What's a better classic tail dragger, the champ or the cub? Champ. What do you like about the champ? Oh, I like that you can uh, fly in the front seat. I think that uh, it's a little bit more comfortable for both uh, the, the, the pilot flying and the pilot not flying or as an instructor. Um, I actually like sitting in the in the back of the champ. It feels like it's, there's a little bit more visibility. There's a little bit more room when uh, flying in the front seat. Same thing. It just feels a little bit more comfortable. Um, I love the Cubs in terms of uh, how you can open the door wide open on a great day and, and fly that around. It's almost like being in an open cockpit. Uh, but I think in the end, uh, I'd gravitate towards a champ if I had to pick. You're based not too far from Oshkosh. So as a somewhat local, what's, in a, what's a tip for us flying to air venture, especially if we're coming maybe from the southeast around the, the Chicago airspace area? What local knowledge can you share with us? I think... Uh, Fly into Oshkosh at a time where uh, the rest of the world isn't trying to get in is a good idea. I know that there's a lot of excitement and everybody wanting to come in on that uh, that Sunday afternoon, but that's probably the worst time in terms of uh, traffic and your workload and your stress level to uh, to fly in uh, by yourself or fly in with a passenger in your plane. And so take a Take a look at the off times, uh, whether it be the next day or the next afternoon or a, a day earlier. Um, of course, whenever the whenever the weather will allow to uh, to do that. So there's there's nothing wrong with looking at a, a less busy time to to go in there. We always like to do one oddball question here in the lightning round. So I know you have a degree in art history. So I've got to ask: Is there a work of art that captures the feeling of flying particularly well? Is there a sculpture or a painting or something out there that should be on the pilot's list? <laughs> wow, uh, that 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 degree has uh, has no place in the aviation world, which is one <laughs> reason why I have yet to use it to this day. That's one of the degrees I have, I should say. Um, so I can't think of anything right now uh, because there's a Right. I'm just not thinking of uh, just not thinking of anything in terms of uh, um, art that would, uh, you know, back through the ages, which is uh, really what my specialty was. I think that was before Da Vinci, even uh, in terms of the area I studied. So there's not a lot of not not a lot of correlation there. There's no great e ancient Greek sculpture about uh, Cirrus side stick operations. I'll take your word for no, that. No, we, no. And we had Da Vinci, and, and that's all great. But uh, so I think now, now that I think of it, I would just point to uh, the Da Vinci drawings because he had some pretty cool flying machines uh, that he had designed in his head. And I think at, at some point uh, drew up every now and then. So um, I think I just came up with an answer. Uh, take a look at Da Vinci. What a what an interesting mind. And sometimes you can see evidence of that in uh, in his work. Our last question is always the same, Elaine. You have one final flight, and we want to know what are you flying and where are you going. I think flying for me has always been about sharing the experience because it is so incredibly amazing. So I would try to get all my pilot friends together in their airplanes and we're going to put GoPros everywhere on those airplanes. And we're going to go flying over the Apostle Islands and I'm going to make a video of that and uh, share that with the world. I think that that would be a, a lot of fun for our final flight. Elaine, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and today's show links, visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.